our topic is Irish writing now, which is a pretty broad topic. And uh, we're joined uh, by our current Irish laureate for, for fiction, Colin Tobin, who's coming to us from Los Angeles. And we're very delighted to welcome him and thank him very much for getting up so early in the morning. Uh, uh, on my right here is Roddy Doyle, who's a familiar face to everybody. Um, and Roddy's recent uh, collaboration with Kelly Harrington, the Olympic uh, medalist, has uh, just won Eason's Sports Book of the Year. Uh, on my left, joining us at short notice, is Audrey McGee, who you'll have seen discussing her book, The Colony, in the last few days. The Colony, of course, was shortlisted for the Booker this year. So we have quite a lot to get through. And if you don't mind, Colm, you are hearing us loud and well, I hope. Oh, yeah. Very good. Uh, if I might start with you, the, the topic, Irish writing now, it's a pretty broad one. Sebastian Barry said four years ago, when he, in his uh, speech, uh, when he was taking over as laureate, that he felt we were entering an unexpected golden age for Irish prose writing. And I wanted to know, what's your assessment of that? Or is that just something we say every 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's interesting the number of books coming out and the quality of them and the fact that almost every season someone arrives uh, who you've never heard of before, it's her first book and um, often there's a second book and, and, and that in, in, in both cases the, the, there's a remarkable new voice and uh, I, I, I think it's following a pattern which is that it, rather than being Irish and representing the nation in some way, these novels and stories seem to me to be representing a single sensibility or a single place. So that in Irish writing generally, it's about putting a flag up over a place rather than saying, I speak for Ireland. You say, well, I speak for myself first. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps there, 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 there are a few streets, a few fields, a few um, motorways, you know, that belong to you and that you put your flag up over. And, and this has been there, I think, throughout the 20th century, this, this idea of, of writing against the nation uh, maybe the word community could be used, but that's not a good word either. I think that the word, maybe the first word is self, and the second word is very specific place. Mm. But even if it isn't a geographical specific place, it's a very specific place of the mind. So, mm. I, so, I, so I think we're, st we're dealing with continuities as much as we're dealing with a big break. Mm. That's very interesting because one of the things that I was struck by this weekend was how many younger Irish writers said that they didn't feel they were coming specifically from an Irish tradition. Um, but then I wondered if, if, if you thought that the, the changes in the past 20 years in Ireland have given younger writers greater freedom to write, uh, given that they're not encumbered by the sort of secrecy or shame or burden of history that many uh, earlier writers were. Oh, well, I think that that um, again idea we're, we're, we're looking at continuities. If, if you look at, for example, the relationship of Joyce to the Irish literary renaissance, saying I've nothing to do with those people. And Joyce's search for Ibsen and search for various other forms, including indeed Homer. And if, indeed, if you look at Beckett's you know, interest, for example, <laughs> in writing in French, when, when, when I was starting to read, the censorship had been lifted and you could buy paperback books you know, pretty easily. I wouldn't have bought an Irish book under it. I mean, Frank O'Connor, or oh, Stephen Dedalus, you know, all those men and their shame and their religion and their Catholicism, their first confession, their last rites, their sermons, their clongos wood, the rain, the misery. I wouldn't have gone near it. I mean, you could go and you could read a book by Hemingway. You could read a book by William Faulkner. You know, you could read Dostoevsky. Like, why would you be stuck with what you're already stuck with? <laughs> and so I think that idea of saying, I don't invent Ireland doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not, a, I'm not really an Irish writer. I'm looking for models elsewhere. My sensibility is A, co cosmopolitan, or B, not stuck in drizzle rain and bad masturbation. That, um, <laughs> You know, th this is something that I think we all went through, uh, and it seems to be part, I think, of any island, um, will, will any small country um, will go, I imagine they're going through this in Lithuania as we speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's, let's ask Roddy Doyle about that, because Roddy Doyle, you, you, you're an Irish writer and you stayed in Ireland, and despite the rain and all the rest of it. Um, 
let's talk about what it was like for when you started off as a writer, because I'm very conscious of the fact that nowadays there seem to be so many uh, creative writing courses and uh, bursaries and, you know, lots of help for people writing. What was it like when you started out? Um, well, I didn't consider myself an, an Irish writer when I started, and I still don't really. I, I, if I have to, it's a bit like Colin mentioned in The Flag. I'm a Dubliner. And I wasn't overly burdened by what literature had come from Dublin. I'd read a bit of it, I loved a bit of it. Flann O'Brien, who wasn't a Dubliner, but I suppose was inspired by Dubliner, was the only Irish writer I'd have, you know, uh, lifted and said, this is my writer. Um, as, as far as I knew, there were no supports whatsoever for writing. There were no courses, there were no writing courses. I didn't feel the lack because I didn't know they existed. And I don't feel anyway. I know that there are colleges in America where I wouldn't be able to teach because I don't have a PhD in writing. <laughs> I've written 12 novels and a lot of other stuff, but I don't have the qualification to teach about writing. So that says a little bit. But I, um, I wasn't aware of any thing. I just wanted to write. And I was very much inspired by friends of mine who'd set up a theatre company in Dublin, Paul Mercier and uh, John Sutton a company called The Passion Machine. And I wanted to write a piece of, uh, a piece of prose that in some way was in the same spirit, you know? Mm -hmm. And I ended up publishing it myself because there was absolutely no interest in it either in Ireland or anywhere else. And I did it myself and away with my friend John Sutton. And looking back on it, I'm glad I did. It was a great experience, it was brilliant. Trying to get the money to do it, uh, writing a business plan that was way more fictional than the book. Um, <laughs> The crack, it was great. I was told that the launch was going to be sponsored by Guinness. So there are still people making their way home from that particular launch <laughs> 35 years later and found out the following morning it wasn't sponsored by Guinness. And uh, the drink cost more than the printing of the book cost. And not for a second did I go, oh, no, I wish I hadn't done that. It was just great. And, um, uh, but... I was, and I don't say this in, with any little, uh, little violin, I was alone, yes. you know? Yes. And I was writing something that I thought was breaking the rules and I was very happy doing that. I was aware of the rules and I was really happy doing breaking the rules. A big giant F you to mm. Ireland and Irish culture, and official Irish culture or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wouldn't have wanted any help looking back on it. Mm. Well, then, you know, in, in writing the, the Barrytown books and then the success with the commitments and the film and all the rest of it and winning the book for Paddy Clark, mm. then that turned the gaze, of course, of the bigger publishers from England onto you. And well, that, you know, that happened before. I mean, once I, once I had uh, a copy of the commitments in my hand, mm. I sent it to uh, English publishers. And um, one, Dan Franklin, who remained my publisher right up to, until he retired, was very enthusiastic about it. So it came out the following year here in Britain, a brand new edition. And uh, that was a good while before the film came out. There was talk of the film, but there was nothing like anybody who's involved in fil film business or has ever been told, we're interested in your book, will know that it's, uh, it's always vaguely science fictional until it happens. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it often doesn't happen at all. Or uh, you're told it's the most wonderful thing they've ever read and that's the last you ever hear. So, um, uh, so I can't actually remember the precise wording of your question, but um, neither can I. <laughs> yeah, that's no, actually, that's reassuring. I can, I can. I can. Uh, I'm only teasing. No, what I was saying was that you know the, the the gaze of the British publishers became you know leaned in the direction of Ireland. Oh, it's more than welcome and to be honest with you. Made oh yeah, it's possible, I suppose, for those who came after. And in that, on that note, I want to turn to Audrey and ask you whether be, you know, going with your manuscript as an Irish writer uh, and following in the footsteps of, of you know, Colm and Anne Enright and all the others, did that make it any easier for you, do you think, to kind of get that foot in the door? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really, I mean, each writer has his or her, their own journey. So, you know, what, what, what's intimidating, what's not intimidating. Um, and, and I remember as a child growing up in the village of Enniscary, just outside Dublin, watching Frederick Forsyth, who used to live in the village. And he'd 
come down the hill every morning to get his newspaper. And he was usually dressed in tweeds, brown, green tweeds. And he'd buy the newspaper and put it under, fold it over, put it un under his oxter and go back up the hill. And I remember, I mean, I was eight or 10 or something. I remember looking at this going, God, that's a lovely life, isn't it? <laughs> and it was totally contradictory in my head. This was, you know, early 1970s to the drama of writing, because the drama of writing was banned books. It was Edna O'Brien, it was John McGahern, it was never write, you know, do never, beco never become a writer because it's the most dangerous place on earth. You know, you'll be banned, you'll be banished, you'll be you just prohibited from completely having any existence. And yet here was this man sauntering up and down the hill, happy as a lark. And then it was like, well, is it because he's English and you're Irish, is, is that the difference? And to be honest, that, that was where I fled then into French and German literature, a bit like Colm is like, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with any of that. You know, I, and I just launched myself into writers like Marguerite de Vasse and for somehow always believed that Beckett was French because I'd read him in French and forgotten that he was Irish because really it was so, it was such an international space that I first inhabited um, as in writing. And then I suppose I, I wrote when I was writing in journalism and then eventually had to, reached a point where I had to write. I wrote first about Germany and I wrote first about the Second World War yes. as though it was just a, the, the war is not a safe space, but it was a kind of a safe space away from Ireland, you know, where I could find myself as a writer. And, and in that book, there's the Peter Faber, who's the German soldier, talks about going to Ireland because I knew in my next book, I was going to go to Ireland. But and can I interrupt you yeah. there and ask you then, why did you come back to Ireland for the colony? Because you kind of have to in the end, don't you? I had to, had to Isn't kind that of, the great you know, conundrum I, I think that's, yeah, for Irish think, writers? The cord is never severed. No, no. And, you know, why, why should it be? You know, you, you, you have these, these first years in this place that inform you, um, no matter how much you try and run away from it or shed it or you know, say I'm different, I'm independent, I'm going to do it my way and, you know. Um, but in the end you do get, and certainly in the colony I got drawn back to trying to understand obviously the impact of colonization on, on, um, on, on us as people but also on language and, and this led me on a, a journey then into exploring the Irish language which I had absolutely run a million miles from as fast as I possibly could as, as a teenager um, because really to, to kind of engage with Ireland in the Irish language was no different to Joyce. It was, you know, it was, it was a language of another era. It was, you know, English, French, German, whatever was the language of the future. Um, and it was only really when I was writing The Colony that I came to understand just obviously the texture of the language, but just the vibrant community that exists in Irish language writing today, in Ireland today, that I wasn't really fully aware of um, and became fascinated by, um, which I can talk about now if, <laughs> if anybody <laughs> wants to. It, and just basically that, that while we were very focused obviously in English in this festival, which has been an amazing festival, there is there is another kind of culture going on of, of, of which I find a really interesting space because when we were growing up, um, you know, kind of the language choices when it came to Irish were quite binary. You know, it was it was you're going to write in English or you're going to write in Irish, um, and you know, people like like these gentlemen here before me chose to write in English. Newly Nigono chose to write in Irish, but it became it was quite a deliberate choice. And and I'm I think what's really fascinating in the Irish language now is it's it's not so binary. You know, people are moving, shifting between the two languages. Um, there's more kind of bilingual work coming through. And since the Good Friday Agreement, I think it's created a new space um, for these kind of binary works. You know, there might be one page in English, one page in Irish. Obviously, you had Michael Hartnett writing and other people writing a long time ago in Irish. But it's, it's, it's creeping into a kind of a more bilingual space in film, in, in, in fiction writing, in poetry writing, which I think is really fascinating to consider that it's a really interesting yeah. journey that we've come on. It's reclaiming this space. Well, I was interested in what you said there about community of Irish writers, and it struck me, what even is an Irish writer? I mean, you have Irish writers living in Ireland, you have Irish writers living in London, you have Irish writers who come and go like you do, 
column. Um, everybody, you'd, I mean, I don't even know how you would define it. Um, as simple, you just, you're just Irish and uh, it's like being bald. <laughs> you know, you can, you can wear a wig, but it wouldn't work, you know? Okie doke. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that too that struck me this weekend was that there were, you know, a lot, there was a lot of talk about um, uh, writing about personal experiences and that, you know, that there is this element of almost sort of confessional, a confessional tone in a lot of the newer Irish writing. And, and people talk about the Sally Rooney effect. And, I, and you know, it's very autobiographical. And I, I wondered, you know, how uh, writers from a different generation look at that. I mean, do, do you feel that that's um, almost uh, too autobiographical? Or, or, you know, is that, where, where is its place in, in, in Irish literature today? I mean, do, do you feel that it sort of, it creates um, a, a distance between the generations? Who wants to answer that? Colm. Um, well, you thinking? know, again, I'll go back to, um, I don't think there's anything more. If you're looking for autofiction, well, you go to the portrait of the artist as a young man. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for autofiction, I mean, Mary Lavin's stories about being a widow, a story like happiness, a story like in the middle of the fields, a story like in a cafe, are so autobiographical and so clearly so. And at the time they were published, people were absolutely aware that this was her life. She was describing those fields in County Meath, being a widow, the loss of her husband at an early age, her three daughters, that they're, 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 that, that makes up really the body of her best fiction. But I think there's something more important, which is the breaking silence is tremendously interesting always. And maybe it's part of the function of fiction is to see if there's a silence and see if there's any way you could get involved in breaking it. And of course, one of the great silences is a silence about the self, it is a silence about who you are and what you feel and what you've been doing. And so that's, that creates, and it's, it's happening in England, it's happening in France, it's happening in Ireland. It's, it's a big deal because it's, it's about things that you thought I would never say, things about me you don't know, things I thought I would never say. And, you, and you're saying that this is generally being written by women. It's mm. blokes are not doing it. I think blokes sh probably should do it, but you can never say should to a writer. Mm. But it is, uh, I think it is creating a great excitement, this idea you're opening a page and someone is going to tell you the truth about themselves. Whereas in, in many ways, fiction itself can be a sort of disguise, a way of finding metaphors, That's a way true. of moving out of the self. But I, I find this, what we might call autofiction or writing autobiographically or writing about your own world or your own self, I find it exciting. Mm. Yesterday in the discussion on the essay, um, it was very interesting to hear um, some of the younger writers saying that they felt that the marriage equality referendum had been a sort of pivotal moment in that people started sharing personal experiences and that for them it opened up an avenue for them to actually write about things that hitherto were concealed or that they felt you couldn't talk about, as you say, you know, silenced. And we know an awful lot about silence in Ireland and shame. So, as you say, that's a good thing. Uh, can it go too much in the other direction? Uh, as for example, um, I think it was Brian Dillon said it, it yesterday, if we're writing an essay particularly, because it lends itself very much to the essay, if, if we're talking about ourselves and our own issues, should anyone care? Or does anyone care? How do we make people care about things that have happened to us? It has to be well written. Mm. It's, it's as simple as that. I, didn't, I had no idea Sally Rooney wrote, or wrote autobiographically. I just think she writes extremely well. No, no, I'm not saying she does, but um, I'm talking about this. Uh, the, there's an, a, a, a sort of a just, I think people have called it the Sally Rooney effect, and that it's kind of young people writing about, uh, you know, falling in love in Trinity College or whatever, that there's a kind of a, a, a fashion for writing about, uh, it, you know. I think, you know, when you're writing a novel, I don't think you should be overly concerned whether it's based on something that actually happened or not. Because mm. a lot of what I've written is inspired by personal experience. But it's, I think it's important for me to stay out of it in that way, just to allow the story to, and to write it as well as I possibly can. And I don't see any change there, really. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I can't speak on behalf of younger writers because I'm not one, but I used to be. 
And I wrote about domestic violence, and I wrote about birth outside marriage, and I wrote about other things that were kind of taboo mm. back then, and to a degree still are, depending mm. on what class you come from. You know, I wrote about unemployment, and I wrote... So um, I don't think... There's a continuity, I think, you know? And the essays, I would agree with Colin, there's a lot of really, really great writing coming out of there. Really, really great writing. People using their bodies, for example, as their material. And I think that's brilliant because the writing is brilliant. And that's the important thing, isn't it? The quality of the writing. Mm -hmm. If the writing isn't good, good luck, but nobody's going to read it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it may well be good therapeutically, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be good. Uh, so it's the quality of the writing that, that matters, regardless of whether... like. I was writing on Friday, I'll be writing on Monday, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and it doesn't matter whether what I'm writing is inspired by my own life, to a slight degree it is, but it's fiction, it's whether it's any good or not that matters. And I felt the exact same way when I was 28. Mm. And I think what you're looking, if you look even at what's happening this this festival, and you we're talking about Irish writing, there's an awful lot that is very, very good. And, mm. and mm. Why, why is that? Is that... Is that a new found freedom? Is that a better education system? Is that more financial support that you were talking about earlier? Or is it just a bit of a, a bit of a kind of a perfect storm where we're growing in confidence and we're growing in our kind of, you know, a lot of what, what you're reading now that's, that's new, it is very international. It's not mm. Irish anymore. It's, it's, it's represented, it, it, it echoes around the world because it is bigger in mm -hmm. just Ireland. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's exciting. You know, it's, it's Yeah, it's a good story is always going to go past its completely, parish, isn't it? Completely. So, mm. again, if you set a story in a city, the, ci the, 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 glo the globe is awash with cities and the urban experience, there are common, you know, obviously growing up in Dublin is different to growing up in London, but there are probably seven eight, or eight things out of the ten that are similar, you know, and it's the, the other two that make it geographically unique. So... Um, I think, you know, you asked a question earlier, what, what does Irish mean? And kind of outside of having a passport or maybe living in the place or wishing to be, to, to be identified as Irish, it doesn't really have much meaning when you're sitting down and write. Mm -hmm. I think myself, it doesn't really. Obviously, if the story is set in Dublin today, you're living in the Republic of Ireland and there are other, you know, mm -hmm. things that hem you in, you know, or that would make it different to if you were writing in Birmingham or Liverpool or... New York or somewhere like that. But other than that, I don't think there is much of a difference, you know? Mm. So it's, if, mm. it's all down again to the, to the story, the quality. I would say, I don't want uh, uh, to, that I get sent a lot of proofs, you know, advanced proofs of books that are coming out. And one of the gleeful things, one of the things I find great is that uh, the huge proportion of them are by women, you know? And it is, to put it mildly, interesting. Uh, why? Why Could you expand on that? Hmm? Yeah. Could you expand? It used to be. Oh. Right. I'll tell. You, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I used to be on panels. Still am. Here I am. But in the past, you know, to be writing or choosing, choosing my favourite books of the year, and somebody said, "Would you make sure you include a woman?" And I used to find that laughable in a way. I just found it ridiculous. But now I was doing a panel of uh, younger writers, and I was asked, "Would you make sure you include a man?" <laughs> yeah. So there's a moment, and do when, we know, you know. We, so can we just tease that out a little bit? When do you think that moment was? When was I, that? I don't really know. Change? Because I don't know. I do know that when, say, for example, the Snapper and the and the Van came out here, and then Paddy Clark, that there were a lot of people looking for the new Roddy Doyle. So there was a lot of attention being given to. I didn't pay attention to it myself because I was at home rearing children and writing books. So, uh, but there were stones being lifted. That look, people looking for the new Roddy Doyle. To my knowledge, they didn't find him as far as I know. And I do think, and it's a great thing that there's no doubt whatsoever Sally Rooney's influence has been big, regardless of whether she wants that or not. Mm. It's there because they're looking for the new Sally Rooney. And um, fair enough, because they're discovering other good writers, very, very good writers who are being published. So it's that moment, I think. Mm. There's probably way more to it than that. Uh, you're right, the same-sex marriage referendum, there was a, you know, there was a confidence in young people. I remember both referenda, both the recent referenda, I remember wondering about the abortion one, and I had to go to it very, very early when the polling booth was opening, because it was going off somewhere. And I knew, I could see, it was, a, at, even at seven in the morning, I think it opened, at maybe eight, 
uh, there was already a queue of young people, mm -hmm. and I thought we're grand. It's gonna, it's gonna be passed. So I think they, they were two moments when young people. I think, for example, the Brexit vote here was old people, inflicting some sort of a nonsensical nostalgia. You know, people who weren't born in World War Two, yearning for World War Two, and the end result, obviously, and. In Ireland, actually, the two referenda, the big referenda, it was young people who persuaded their grannies and their fathers and, you know, everybody to vote their way. Through, and I think that narrative. probably had a colossal yeah. impact on yeah, and it. Was, mm. It was through narrative. It was using narrative. Yeah, using the stories. It story. always is. And it was using the individual mm. story. Mm. And just were you talking about the, this kind of autobiographical where literally people went from house to house explaining why things yeah. had to change. And, and I think that that was a watershed moment, but I, but I think for women too, um, you know, you've liked the likes of Mary Lavin, you've obviously like Edna O'Brien, you've got, you know, you've, you've people who broke through the pain barrier mm -hmm. um, and allowed others to follow. But, but there wasn't really a, a full following until probably about the kind of 2000s when things mm. started to really change for women. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it wasn't always an easy space, even in the, even as late as the 2000s for, for Irish women writing, you know? So it's really only been in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years that there's some, we're beginning to find some actual there was, yeah, clarity there was, of, of... Jennifer Johnson, I think, is a huge figure. Yeah. And Anne, Anne Enright. Anne Enright. Huge, yeah. enormous yeah. figure. Yes. Yeah. Just yes. yeah. carries so much weight so brilliantly, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a friend, so happy to say that. And another figure that we tend to forget, but shouldn't, is Maeve Binchy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things when we're talking about Irish writing, that we don't give uh, maybe enough um, credit to, to writers of more commercial fiction, lighter, you know, Marion Keyes, for example. Yeah, if you want to read a good book and you want to be shocked and Mellor, laugh, Marion Keyes is a woman. Dealing with family right? issues and relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And they don't get included in the canon no. of Irish literature. And yet, you know, they sell <laughs> millions. They sell millions and, and they write, again, right. they write very well, yeah. you know, again, that's all I ask really is that you write well and they both do brilliantly, you know, so, yeah, um, I think as well, my sense when I'm listening to younger people is, you know, they're not as obsessed with being, it's a bit like, you know, if I, if I ask one of my kids, have you heard this, they don't care if it's cool, if it's hip, if it's new, if it's commercial or if it's all right to be seen listening to it as opposed to heard listening to it yeah. they listen to everything and there's no difference in their minds between bob dylan and lizzo it's good and they're not as you know self-conscious as people of my age would have been at their age and i think it's much the same with younger writers probably as well they're not as obsessed with saying the right thing or wearing the right jacket or being considered literary you know which is just you know snobbery really so they're not. Uh, they're I, not think, I think it came out of fear. You know, you're, mm. we're, we were we latched onto things much more than the current younger generation would, because they became identifiers. Mm -hmm. You know, you became you you became marked by this particular thing, which allowed you form a social group around it. Um, you know, and whether it was opposed to something or in favour of something, and, and I think that became kind of almost necessary to kind of the growing up in Ireland kind of thing that that absolutely young people do not have now it's it's like whatever yeah much more tolerance much more acceptance mm. of and i think that's absolutely coming through in the literature that's absolutely mm -hmm. coming mm. through in the books that are written that you know you can and probably you can the advent of of you know, the internet and the digital age generally as well has must have some well, I, th I think that again internationalizes yeah. our thinking internationalizes mm. our our reading and internationalizes in the end our writing and more than that, it also um, allows people to have opinions and to express them publicly. Um, Colin, I just wanted to turn to you there. It was often said that uh, uh, the arrival of the Kindle, say, for example, or the digital age would just drown out you know, the world of books. But that hasn't happened. People still like to buy a book and hold a book in their hands, don't they? And reading is just as popular as ever, as I'm sure you, you, know, you realise now, because you, as laureate, I think you've instituted a monthly book club um, uh, event with uh, with libraries. I think that's been the real big change in Ireland, which is the arrival of a serious readership. In other words, so it was a time when you published a hardback in London. It was it could be banned in Ireland, but even if it wasn't banned, I'm talking about the 50s, that that the book would not really receive a wide readership in your own country. 
I think that's really changed now. And that's something I really obviously notice that you're in a library, there's a new novel out and everyone is reading it with great interest, enthusiasm, but also intelligence. And there was something I was thinking about while you were talking about, um, you know, the referendum, say the same sex referendum. We were told as gay people, the best thing for all you guys to do is go quiet. Now let your sister speak, let your mother speak, let your granny speak. And you just don't make your argument about human rights, you know, don't like tell your story, but make it soft. Like don't argue, don't interrupt. And that was great because it worked. It was really well done. But it left a strange silence at the end where, if you just think about it, Ireland is a very, very unusual country in that the number of, um, you know, cisgender writers and straight writers who have written gay characters in Ireland is, is, really, is really an extraordinary number. In other words, um, I could list them for you. And the number of gay writers who've emerged from that, say, same sex campaign are very few. And say, if you look back, writers like Kate O'Brien, John Broderick, for example, are writers that barely get mentioned now. And they represent a strange dotted line tradition of gay writing in Ireland. But it is a silence and it is a sort of funny invisibility. And so there's always a silence that some writer in 10 years time, someone will, could look back at what I'm saying and think that's ridiculous. Look at what's happened in the last 10 years. So there are always silences to write out of. And in, there are always readers, it's, it's what's, what's interesting as well, is there are always readers open to that. You know, you know, it isn't as though you're pushing against a, a, a locked door. It is that, 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 that there is now, at least I'm, that's what I'm finding, a, a real openness to not only content, but, but formal trickery, um, you know, doing, do, doing something strange with a novel is absolutely fine with readers. Hmm. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we're very good at, you know, I think we do have to kind of bow here a little bit for whatever reason, the Irish and the Irish writing community remains very good at narrative, you know, mm -hmm. that, that even though, you, you say, you know, a lot of the, the kind of French German writing that I would have um, read in my, in my younger days, you know, as I grew up as a writer, um, you know, a lot of it would, would be really wonderfully and tons to think about, but not actually have necessarily a great narrative. And I think there's so much Irish writing that is a blend, it's almost like a European blend of, of philosophy, sociology, but also narrative, you know. And we're not afraid of narrative in Ireland, which I think is really a wonderful space. Mm. It's wonderful to, to embrace narrative and to to just celebrate that in our works, which I think, you know, we do, mm -hmm. um, which we kind of take for granted, but we do like telling stories. That's true. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that comes back to our general, you know, love of conversation. Uh, you, I mean, you, you know, people talk to each other all the time, you know, they, they, they talk on the bus or, you know, they'll talk in, in the queue. Uh, and, you know, we're talkers and we, we, do, we don't like a silence. And uh, I think that then comes into writing as well. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? We're just good at dialogue and we're good at talking. Would you agree with that, Roddy? Yeah, but I wouldn't insist that everybody be a good talker, you know. You're less Irish if you can't carry a conversation. You know, you might just be a shy Irish person. <laughs> you like listening to yeah. people talking. And I would have been one of them, you know? Would you? Ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would have been listening rather than talking. I'd, 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 I'd have been confident talking to a small group of people. But, uh, yeah, I do think if there's a joke doing the rounds, it'll become a, jo it'll become a story, something that actually happened, no matter what, how absurd. And I think we convert the jokes into stories, yeah. And the... Um, I was just thinking there today of the Playboy of the Western World and how what gets Christie accepted is his story. He tells a convincing story and he becomes the hero. And they don't want the reality, they want the story. And I think, uh, yeah, we do, we do tell good stories, I think, yeah. Um, so I do think there's that. I don't think it's uniquely Irish, but it's there, there's no doubt. We don't like... You're right. I heard a man talking to another man on the tube yesterday, across the aisle, and I went, Jesus. And whereas if it happened on the bus in Dublin, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. have noticed, you know. Yeah. Uh, it would feel perfectly natural. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember getting off a bus in London a while back, and I said thank you to the driver. And he, I, thought he, I think he thought I was going to stab him or something, you know. <laughs> whereas it's perfectly normal. Yeah. 
and uh, there was a guy behind me getting off the bus recently in Dublin on uh, Talbot Street, and he said to the driver, driver, that was flawless. <laughs> he was acting the maggot, obviously, and it was just basically the, the trip, the entire trip involved one right-hand turn. Uh, so, the, <laughs> and the, it wasn't raining, it wasn't snowing, and yeah, it, it, you know, it, that only happened the once, but if somebody said, where did that happen? Dublin, yeah. you know? So it is true, yeah, we do like, silence isn't an option really. And Not it, really. When I was a teacher as well, all the kids, all they wanted to do was talk. <laughs> you know, all they wanted to do was talk. And it was like your job was to herd it into what you wanted them to talk about. Mm -hmm. But all they wanted to do was talk. Mm -hmm. Fair play to them. Mm -hmm. Roddy, just while you're on the, the, the subject of children there, it reminds me that you were involved for a long time with this uh, Fighting Words. Still am. And you still are. Mm -hmm. You co-founded it. Did. And uh, can you tell us a bit about that? You know, I'm thinking about the next generation of readers and writers and how, how they can be kind of nurtured. Yeah, well, uh, myself and another man, uh, Sean Love, set up this organisation, Fighting Words. We opened in 2009. And what we wanted to do was make creative writing in its various forms as inviting and as doable and as enjoyable as possible to children and young people initially. And to make, you know, because the education system in, in, in Ireland, in some ways it's excellent, but in other ways it's just atrocious. And the, the, the insistence on measuring the worth of a child <coughs> according to their exam results uh, is just horrible, you know, and it's, it's distorted and it's wrong. And I know even my children who have been through the education system when it came to exams, they were actively encouraged not to write the short story, for example, because it doesn't get as many marks as writing an essay. And I thought, you know, what a perverse way of looking at it. Considering, you know, you're dead half an hour, if you're a writer in Ireland, you're dead half an hour and there'll be a T-shirt and a tea towel. You know, we, we, we flog the country, sell the country using dead writers. And uh, yet, you're still trying to stifle the living ones. And I don't mean myself, I mean the kids. So we set up Fighting Words, and we now have branches, I suppose, of groups throughout the country, hundreds of thousands of children we've worked with, uh, currently working with retired printers, for example. We've worked with dockers, uh, people in prisons, an extraordinary um, array in a, 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 all forms of creative writing. And it's, uh, for me, I love it because... Um, I get so much out of it, really. I was in a prison recently and did a bit of script writing for two hours with a group of men. And Jesus, it was fantastic, you know? And I wasn't, you know, and, and the reason I said I'd do it was because I knew I was going to enjoy it. Mm. And uh, you go through the whole rigmarole of security and the rest of it, and it's, you know, you can be, it can, it's not a life you'd wish on anybody, really. But the two hours of doing this, the, the writing a script, just two characters with these men, was extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. And not all of them were Irish born either, and some of the great ideas were coming from more recent arrivals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great stuff. And it's the same with kids, really. It can be so inspiring what they're writing. And uh, fantasy is a huge thing. You know, a mystery to me because I never read it when I was their age, but a huge, huge thing among kids. I was with a group of, I think, about 10, 15, 16 year old kids. And totally independently, two young women, say if this is a room, one over there, one over there, were writing about a burning house. Hmm. And I said, was that a school exercise or something? No, it was a pure coincidence. That's the two of them were writing very different stories about a house burning. Yeah. And uh, fascinating, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of great... I think if we talk about, you know, the hyphenated Irish, the newly arrived Irish, people who are speaking a different language at home than they are on the street or whatever, music is always first because it's more immediate. Yeah. Uh, and I think writing follows afterwards. And I think a lot of the, from, to my eye, when I'm reading a lot of the stuff by kids over the last 10 years or so, a lot of the really interesting English has been written by people who speak a different language at home or listen to a different language at home. Mm. And uh, they're adding, the Irish language bubbling under the English in Ireland act, adds an extra, you know, an extra elbow to the grammar, an extra joint. We break rules knowing actually they used to be our rules before we were given other rules and that type of sense of sentimental nonsense. But um, uh, there are writers now who have even more layers, layers or more 
uh, they're adding not just the one elbow, but two or three elbows to the grammar. And, it, it, you know, uh, so, you know, it'll be a different, you know, in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, there'll be a different group of writers on this stage, perhaps, talking about the latest wave of Irish yes. writing. It'll be very interesting to hear the viewpoints, I think, of those people who have come to mm. live in Ireland with a different perspective, as opposed mm. to people who have grown up there. And again, the sensitivity to language will, yeah, will absolutely. absolutely feed through, and it's going to create a very dynamic space. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, it's, uh, I, I think we, we all have grown up whatever our relationship with the Irish language, it has grown up and informed our relationship with English, mm -hmm. whether we want it or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. We have been influenced and informed, and even if it's only to, to ignore and move away from and even flee from, it's still defining us, even if we don't want to be defined by it. So that's, so it's going to be interesting to see if you add more languages into the country, yeah. into, the, mm. into the, the melting the, pot. Yeah, mm. what happens. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, we talked earlier a bit about the, the, the digital age and, and all the rest of it, and I wondered if you had any experience of, you talked about young people reading fantasy, the fantasy is a big thing. Are young people reading? You've got three. I've got three. So, you? I, I mean, I, the, the big concern I would have is, is the impact of COVID, because it's definitely put all these kind of early teens, mid-teens, completely onto screens. I don't know, I'm sure other people have different experiences, but but it definitely, there's, um, my older children will be reading, um, but the younger, the younger kind of mid-teens down, they are so now used to screens, they're so visual in how, now they're, they see things can be different because they have a visual, more of a visual brain than they have a word brain. Um, but it's just kind of fascinating in terms of, of, of how they spend their time and how informed it is by the image rather than the word. And sometimes you feel we're going back to hieroglyphics, <laughs> you know, that the, um, the mm. you know, and yet the flip side of it is a lot of these kids, when they text and all the rest of it, they're writing more than we would ever have written. Um, as, so, you know, there's, but it's, it's in the standard format, the, um, a lot of children now are, are not picking up books and sticking with them in, in the younger age groups, definitely not, it's harder for them. Is that an attention span thing because of instant information? Yeah, I think it's, think? it's hard. Like learning how to read is quite hard. You know, there's, there's research deep. coming out to show yeah. that you know the focus, focus, capa focal capacity now of nine-year-olds in Ireland is is much reduced, um, and a lot of that has been since COVID. A lot yeah. of the kids are have not got the attention, so it's easier to kind of shy away from sitting down still with a book, and going off into the world of images. I think just to reassure you a little bit, I mean, yeah, I was hearing do. the same thing in the staff room at the school I taught in 35 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, they I, don't read. Yeah, and you hear it. Yeah. Oh, they don't read. They have a tension span of a gnat. Yeah. And yet they're the same people who produce the books we were talking about yeah, over well, the weekend. Fine. If, if they I'm come wrong, back to I'm it. happy. Come back so to just, it. again, I, I wanted to stress, but, you know, let's not overdo the Irish thing, but I'm going to do the Irish thing now. It'll be grand. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'd hate to not have readers and writers, you know? Colm, I just wanted to ask you something. It was something that Roddy brought up there about the different voices coming into Ireland, you know, people from other countries coming to live there and adding their own, you know, unique um, um, languages and, and, and culture to what will be the next bout, I suppose, of, of Irish, the next generation maybe of Irish writing. Um, have you come across that at all? Uh, or what do you think of that? Um, I, I think that one of the things that writing shows is how few borders there are. And the border, strangely, between Ireland and England has always been, been a, a dotted border or a strange unma unmapped border in a way for as regards writing. In other words, that since the early 19th century or even before, perhaps, Irish writers have gone to London to publish. Mariah Edgeworth went, William Carlton went, everybody else went after that. And so there's been a, always a group of London editors who've always been alert to what's happening in Ireland and open to new Irish books coming. But one of the other things we have is um, Irish books go to England. Um, but, but what's happening in England is really very interesting that, that, that underneath Brexit, there's been something else going on which you can see in the universities in the north of England, for example, a whole new generation of people emerging from the universities whose parents didn't go to university, whose parents often came from other countries. 
and they're becoming first generation. And this is happening in writing, where if you look at the sort of fact that the hyphen has become the thing, in other words, people like Zadie Smith, Monica Ali, Salman Rushdie, I could mention many, many others, who really do have an extraordinary position now in English writing, where it isn't exactly that they dominate, but, but it's taken for granted that they're there. The images they create have been images of immense importance for the entire society in a sort of undercurrent. And I think that things like that that happen in England often happen in Ireland mm. um, 20, 30 years later. Mm. And so that's something we will be seeing in the future. But it's very interesting to look to England and to see that it's, it's, it's one of the things in literary life. But literary life that, 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 that has really made a difference, I think, to sort of making images in the society that, that has affected film, has affected television, and I think has affected politics. Mm -hmm. Just before we turn it over to the audience for a few questions, I just wondered if um, you'd had any experience of, of publishers in Ireland talking about difficulties in terms of financial pressures, you know, uh, at the moment, and, you know, just in terms of the cost of print and supply issues and all the rest of it, and whether, whether that seems to be... O'Brien Press, I think, last week said it's a very serious situation for Irish publish, publishers and how that could affect the publishing industry. No, you haven't heard that, no? No. The cost of raw materials has gone up, which means that they're yeah. going to make books more expensive, potentially. So, yeah, um, but I haven't, had a, I haven't had a head-to-head -head conversation with anybody no, about you it. You haven't no. heard anything about that? No. Well, maybe that's hopefully something we might avoid, you know, if... Um, I mean, even if it does become that books become, again, very expensive, right? mm. which at least there are now alternative ways of reading. Yes, got the know, digital. And downloading mm. and digital. So, you know, there are options now that there wouldn't have been... Um, yeah, 10, 15 years ago. So publishing can still happen. And you readers know. will still want books yeah. because that's, obviously that's as our we plan. ascertained, you know, <laughs> it's our hope. writing, Irish writing and Irish publishing is in a healthy state. It's um, like the price of the pint. <laughs> but once it reaches a quid, I'm never going to buy a pint again. <laughs> once it reaches two quid, I'm never going to buy a pint again. So with a bit of little luck, a little bit of luck, it'll be the same with uh, books. Yeah. Absolutely. Once it reaches fifty quid, <laughs> well, we'll certainly I'll be, finally we'll be borrowing them a lot more. Yep. I'd like to uh, to turn uh, turn over to the audience now, and we have two roving mics, and I wonder if you could put your hand up anywhere at the back. I think there's someone at the back. It's hard to see. Could you? There we go. Hello. Hi. Is that working? Okay. Um, so my question is, um, you guys were talking a lot about, you know, different kind of writers and writing styles, you know, just waves of, of, of kind of topics and patterns and things. Um, and I've noticed um, there's been a, a new wave of, of Irish music, um, both from the Republic and from Northern Ireland, things like, you know, Fontaine's DC or Soak and things. Um, and what role do you, do you think that um, these kinds of new types of Irish music have in, in the literary world? Did you hear that? Yeah. Um, so, I don't know the, uh, the intriguing questions. musicians you're talking about, but I think it is very interesting. There's always a, an influence of, of music on, on, on language, even if it's subconscious, so that when different generations write, they will be influenced by the music that they listen to. Um, and I think, I don't know, again, the people you're talking about, but, but I think it's really interesting to hear the different languages coming into, into music that's being, that's being created now, both north and south of the border, as, as we, we have different languages now in Ireland. Um, and in, into rap and things like unsho into rap. It's like, who would have thought of that? Um, and that definitely will, that is definitely a pulse that feeds it to, into writing. There's no question of it because it is, it is a poetic form that will then feed into, into the way to each generation, as I said, will have their own music and their own hinterland that then feeds into the writing. Absolutely. Yeah, completely. How that is manifest, well, we wait and see. And I think you mentioned, I, I couldn't really hear what you said, but I think you mentioned Fontaine's DC. Yeah, yeah I, I, I really, really like them. I have all their records on vinyl, may I say? And uh, I really do like them. And uh, what I find really fresh about them is that they wear their influences on their sleeve, really. They talk about the Dubliners. Now, I grew up 
sneering at the Dubliners, really, because my dad liked the Dubliners. So it was my job not to like the Dubliners <laughs> until about 10 or 15 years later when I began to listen and I realised, oh, they're good. <laughs> and I didn't, you know, uh, I think my dad probably started listening to the Sex Pistols at that stage <laughs> just to have a row with me. But it's really interesting, that the continuity there, you know. But I love the immediacy of their music. And there's a thing I find how... Uh, it may seem trivial, but last year, Bohemian's football club had a line from a Fontaine's DC stitched into the back of the jersey, Dublin in the rain is mine. And it says so much, I think, about Dublin, the attitude. And I thought I loved the link between the line, literature, the football, the music. And it was a bit like that when I was a teenager. There was no separation of... Mm. Mm. Oh, I play football, therefore I cannot read books. You did both. Not at the same time, necessarily. <laughs> Unless you were in goal and your team was extremely good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But So I, I really think, and there's a lot of... And I find it easier sometimes to get the music than I do some of the very young writing. I feel I inhabit the music. I feel, yeah, this was written for me as much as it was written for people of their age more so sometimes than the, than the writing. And that's not to disparage the writing at all, you know. It's just, now and again, I'm watching something on the telly and I haven't a clue what's going on. And I know it's because I'm 40 years too old. And no amount of explaining will ever make it feel like home. And that's grand. I don't, you know, I just don't watch it. That's the easy thing, rather than give out about it. So uh, the Fontaines DC, I just think, uh, are pretty magnificent. There's another lesser-known band, The Murder Cathedral. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Sorry? The Murder Capital, is it? Murder Capital. I said the Murder Cathedral. That's an entirely different piece of work, isn't it? <laughs> Written, little known, little known fact, he was an Irish man too. <laughs> yep. Anybody else? You know, we've got a question come in from online, okay. from Evelyn, who asks, uh, it's a question for Colm, um, what about immigrant American languages influencing your writing? And whilst that's sinking in, I'm going to pass this one to you. Um, I don't really know, you know, influence comes in the strangest ways and I'm 67, it's very hard to get influenced at 67, <laughs> at 67. I mean it really is, you're sort of impervious to everything, you're just sitting there, <laughs> mad, you know, <laughs> strange memories and, you know, um, so I, I, I don't really, I mean America doesn't really make that much difference to me, I'm sort of in my own head and the books I've read and things that happen, but um, it's very, very hard to work out what influences you or what difference things make to you. You just honestly don't know. You sort of write out of a very personal DNA, a sort of style that's yours and that isn't anybody else's. And, and that's a mystery as to how that comes in words, something that comes personally from you. It's very hard to intervene in that directly as influence, and it's very hard even to know what the influences are. And you can't analyse them too much either. You just got to feel them. Mm. You're, you're almost like you're almost you're almost like a jellyfish, and things kind of filter through you. And, and you know, you just yeah. go along, bob along, and take on all those yeah. filters, and, and just just absorb and yeah. absorb and absorb, and then see who, what happens. Who you would know? you feel has been you know a, a big influence on your writing, Audrey? Oh, there's, there's no question. So many. It's, it's the French writer. No, the French mm. writer Marguerite Duras. Absolutely, mm. she blew my mind when I was about 16 or 17 I met her for the first time and I'd been full of, you know, Dickens and um, Jane Austen and all the, obviously Shakespeare too, but but not so much Irish writing, but, but British writing and it was, you know, every sentence told you what to feel and I was like, yeah, you know, can't I figure it out myself? And I met her and she does not tell you how to feel, she does not tell you, tell you how to think, she just creates this space and it just it was revolutionary for me i was just this is a place where i can be this is a place where i can feel for myself think for myself and she would just create a mood and an atmosphere and i was allowed to be there and yeah it was it was radical mm. it was um, very revolutionary for me so and she remains incredibly important uh, her work is astonishing mm. any other questions yeah um it's more of a question, I think, for Roddy and Colm. Uh, Audrey has uh, already referred 
briefly to the Irish language. And I'm curious if either of you, oh, by the way, thank you for all for being here. <laughs> I'm curious uh, what you thought about what Audrey said and to what extent you think there is any shift in your experience about the relationship between an Irish and, <coughs> and English, and indeed, perhaps, what has been your relationship with Irish? I'd be fascinated by that. Uh, do you want me to answer? I went to a Christian brother school, <laughs> and it's very hard to come out of a place like that with a love of the Irish language. <laughs> you know, it's very hard to come out of that with a love of fucking anything, really. <laughs> so, uh, I had a hearty dislike of the Irish language because they tried to beat it into us. And the attitude in the 70s and the 60s was that if you were less Irish if you didn't speak Irish, you were less Irish if you came from Dublin, you were less Irish if you were a Protestant, uh, you were less Irish if you lived on the East Coast, you know, you were less Irish if you wore Levi jeans, if there were any black musicians on your vinyl collection, whatever, you know, it was just... Uh, that type of world. So, and I knew a story. My father was a printer and then he taught printing and graphic design in a college of technology in Dublin. And for a summer, he thought he didn't have a job. When he had two very young children, he thought he didn't have a job because he left school when he was 15 and he had to do an oral Irish exam. And he failed it. Not because his Irish wasn't good enough, but because they didn't like his pronunciation. So himself and my mother endured three months not knowing whether he had a job or not, which anyone in the room will realise is an eternity. In the 1950s, in Ireland, not having a job. And then when he went in back to work in September, hoping he'd be let in the door, they let him do the test again and they passed it. And to me, there was that little bit of bitterness in the house. Both rabid Republicans but they had that little bit of bad bitterness towards that, that inflicting a culture which wasn't really theirs on them. And I never really got out of that, I've got to say. I do like the fact that the Irish language is still alive. And I found watching that film, that recent film on Colleen Kuhn, The Quiet Girl, a deeply emotional experience because not only was it a really good film, it was the first time I think I've ever heard the Irish language being used in a way that seemed really spoken and that I never had to look at a... Even though I, I, I left school in 1976, I never had to look at the subtitles to figure out what was being said. But there was an interesting thing. The little girl in it said at one point she had to go for a piss. We never learned how to say that in, in Irish. We learned how to say, on Milkiadagum Golgadi and Letters, do I have permission to go to the toilet? Mm. But we were never allowed to specify in any way. We didn't realise there was a slang or there was an informal language, you know? No attempt to actually to make it fun. Mm. So I'm very, I'm very conflicted about it, but you know, I do love the idea that it's still alive. But my kids, they went through the same educational experience 30 years later. They've no great grow for the Irish language either, so it's, it, it's a big, big problem, I think. But I do, I, you know, at the same time, I'm delighted it's still alive and well, and I wish it the best. Mm. I really do, but it shouldn't be compulsory. Yeah. That was the problem, making it compulsory. I thought it was... The, the, the name alone puts you off, doesn't it? You know, so... Uh, mm. Have I answered it? Yeah. Well, absolutely, you've answered and it. And again, <laughs> not for the first time. I feel much better having spoken <laughs> Ventilated. Um, well, we've come to the end of the session, and uh, it just remains for me to thank our wonderful panel, uh, Con Tubin and Roddy Doyle. Yes. All I can see is his glasses. <laughs> thank you. And also Roddy Doyle. And Audrey McGee. And thank you for being a wonderful audience. And for Book her. signings are still taking place. All the best. And thanks to our chair and Claire.